Welcome to the CEC Report. It's August 13. I'm Robert Barwick, and I'm reunited again with CEC leader Craig Ishwood. Welcome yeah, Craig. thanks, Robert. It's good to be back. Feeling better? Yes, thanks. So am I. All right. In this week's CEC Report, one, nationalise electricity and jail the privatisers. Second, Glass-Steagall debate erupts in Australia. And finally, curiosity triumph gives humanity hope. So first, nationalise electricity and jail the privatisers. Craig, we've had a phony war, um, a phony debate initiated in Australia in this past week by Julie Gillard about what's, what's driving up the power prices. Yeah, Robin, I think it's, a, it's important early in the piece to point out to people this is a phony debate because what we've had essentially since the Kennett era here in Victoria is this push towards radical privatisation of electricity assets. By both sides? By both sides of Parliament, yeah. And look, we, we called this back in 1996. We published this particular new citizen, Global Financial Crack Underway, 1996. And we go through in detail the nature of the push for privatisation. There's a big, a big report in this particular paper talking about specifically the privatisation of, of electricity assets, right? And this comes out of an organisation called the Montparon Society and its branches down here in Australia. I mean, you're talking about the Tasman Institute, which was instrumental in the privatisation down here in Victoria. You're talking about the Inter Institute for Public Affairs, the Centre for Independent Studies, the H.R. Nichols Society. All these were spurned off, this mother organisation called the Montparon Society, uh, back in the 1970s. So every single debate that we're having now about privatisation, whether it's good or bad, electricity prices, has been spurred by this political operation to basically destroy the infrastructure, uh, not just in electricity, but everywhere in our economy. It's a deliberate policy of economic destruction. And in the case of electricity, um, it's such an important utility. Well, it's the, the energy it, it is, is the source, of, is, the, is the, su the lifeblood of any economy. Without a cheap, fundamental strong, reliable electricity source, energy source, you cannot have a developed modern economy. So they know that and they also know that it means you've got a, your consumers are a captive market and they thought, well, how can we turn this from being something that provides a service to people and, business and industry to something that we can gouge and actually kill people, and we'll talk about that, to profit from it. And profit in a way that props them up. And I think if you look at the recent uh, reports from Victoria, like for example the big problems that Alcoa's got, I mean, smelting and making aluminium from alumina is a very, very energy in intensive process. And if you do not have cheap power, then you lose the capacity to produce aluminium, a basic metal that is necessary for the infrastructure of any modern society is going to get destroyed because of these power prices. So Craig, this debate when, when it erupted in this last week in Australia, it reminded me of the movie The Sting. You know, where Gillard is actually teaming up with the Liberals to take people's attention off the real issue, mm. right, where they look like they, they seem to be at odds, but in, but in fact both sides are pushing the same system here. The question is not what's driving up the prices, the issue is what is this system that we've got? And it's called the National Electricity Market. It's a deregulated um, market that allows the, the um, uh, private corporations to profit from the very inadequate provision of electricity. Uh, Gillard is using such terms as gold plating as if that's a bad thing when what gold plating means is actually investing in act physical infrastructure for the long term, i.e. with a view that, that demand will expand in the future. And they're saying, that the accountants are saying, oh no, you shouldn't do that, it's a waste of money. But then they say that they, they use that as the excuse, that's what's driving up the prices, etc. And so the consumers are supposed to think that's bad. I think under a privatised system, Robbie, what people have to understand is you're pitting directly the, sh the value of the shareholders in private companies and their interests, which is always short term, as opposed to the general welfare and the development of an economy, which is always long term, 25 to 50 years. And in basic economic infrastructure, it isn't possible to make the sorts of profits necessary in order to support the economy no. unless you price gouge, unless you basically destroy the quality of the infrastructure overall and make those very, very quick and um, big profits. Now what, um, I want to get into some of the details in this, yeah, before, but before, just one other overall point, um, people might say, well, hang on, what's come out this week is that it's one of the 
one of the offenders is state governments who haven't privatised, like in New South Wales, they're gouging profits out of the power companies to prop up their budgets. But those same state governments are heavily in debt to the international money markets. And effectively, they're using the infrastructure of power to be able to pay their own debt back. So whichever way you cut it, this gouging is being used to it's either propping up the financial system through private companies or still propping up the financial system through state governments. And under national competition policy, Craig, all governments are supposed to function as private businesses anyway, right? Um, what Gillard is doing though, specifically, she's peddling a white paper that her government has prepared on this, Martin Ferguson's department has prepared on it. And this white paper, draft energy white paper, strengthening the foundations for Australia's future, in its executive summary, it trumpets, quote, the era of cheap energy is over. And if you go through the details, it's what it is, it's the fulfillment of the reform process that was started by our favourite politician again, Paul Keating, um, where he wanted to create a British-style national electricity market of private power companies. And by British style, what that meant was where companies could sell power outside of their geographical location, which effectively means they're not, you know, you can, people and consumers in Victoria can buy power from New South Wales, but the power's not coming from there. It's paper power. It's the trading of contracts that, that accounts for it. It's not actually being provided, but it creates a market, right? And I'm going to show you a graph in a minute. Um, Keating started this, this was his vision, and, and when Morrissey Emma failed in privatising in uh, uh, 2008 and nine, Keating went into bat for him saying, hang on, I want my vision realised here. Jeff Kennett initiated the process, and that's why we did that, that new citizen back then that you've just said, under the rubric of Keating's national competition policy. Under Howard, to show you that they're all in on it, it was under Howard that the states all moved to deregulate so they could create the national um, grid, they called it, and which is supposedly putting um, extension leads over the borders and right, so all, all the states are connected now except for New Western Australia because it's too far away and the na this national electricity market and here's a key point when they set up the rules because even though it's deregulated they've got to pretend to have some rules when they set up the rules to create the national electricity market it, w it, cre it allowed a ceiling on the spot price of electricity which is the peak can be that electricity can spike to at the time, around two, the year 2000, of $10,000 a megawatt hour. Now, we looked up our electricity bills, Craig, yeah. and what are we paying at the moment in well, kilowatt hours? 20, 25 cents is now the peak. 25 cents is the hour. peak price, yeah. and then megawatt hours, that's $250. Yeah. But the rules of the market say that that's what we're, the consumers are paying at the end of the line, but the traders can actually spike that up to 10, 12, 000. well initially it's 10,000, they've already right. raised it to $12,000, right? Um, but Rob, what's shocking to me is that back in 2008, you look at the same power bill, you're paying 15.3 cents, now we're paying 25.3. That's a That's big jump. 10 cents per kilowatt hour. This is all due to the speculative markets that have been brought in. And that's why people should be very enraged about this whole idea of speculation and private of, of the privatised uh, electricity market. Well speaking of speculative markets, we put, we've in the uh, Australian Financial Markets Association report, AFMA, which includes all speculative markets in Australia, they also cover the electricity market. And there's a graph here that shows that the trading in futures and options of electricity, especially in um, uh, exchange traded futures, is many times the volume of actual um, electricity produced and consumed in Australia. So they're having a ball in, in um, uh, you know, hundreds of megawatt hours of production that's many times what it's actually used in Australia. That's the, the kind of market we're talking about that's driving it up, and we'll put that graph up on the screen. Here's what Gillard's white paper calls for, and this is the Labor government, right? So it's like all pretenses are, are abandoned. One, um, that there will be required investment of $240 billion by 2030, which will be sourced by foreign capital. And I want you to talk about that in a minute. Two, the full privatisation of assets, so no state is allowed to have government-owned assets anymore. The full deregulation of retail prices. Now what that means is the rules now that stop consumers having to ever be exposed to that $12,000 megawatt hour price hike, that will be taken away. 
and consumers will be exposed to that. Smart meters to, con to cut consumption or, or initiatives to cut consumption because they don't want to build more actual power stations, so they want the consumers to cut consumption. That's one of the reasons they're making it more expensive. So smart meters is one way. And in Adelaide, you can sign up to a program where you can volunteer to have the power station cut off your power in a heat wave. Um, uh, now, that kills people. And in 2009, here in Melbourne, there was a heat wave in the week before the Black Saturday bushfires that killed more people than the Black Saturday bushfires, the elderly, because these heat waves can be real killers. Um, and then a fully national electricity market is what they're also calling for, which would include Western Australia, which would be, which would be paper. Um, what this is, Craig, is they've turned our electricity system into Enron. And the thing with Enron, it got caught out back in its day. Uh, actually, they deregulated in, 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 in um, the United States. And then Enron was... It emerged later after it was bankrupted. It was it was calling up power generators and getting them to turn off the power, create massive blackouts that that did a lot of damage in California especially. So they could put force the the um, spike up. Here's what I wanted you to comment on in the time we've got left. At the time, our our associates in America, led by Louis Rich, were campa campaigning against deregulation. No one knew quite what Enron was up to, right? The the actual criminality, but the politicians kept saying, you can't put the toothpaste back into the tube. You can't change the system back to what it was. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Even though the system they were defending was actually a criminal system. And killing people. Um, what if we did cut the crap and put the toothpaste back in the tube? What, could a, what sort of system can we go back to? You have to go, look, look at what was taking place before all this took, uh, took over, this, this idea of privatisation took over. Essentially, you had sovereign states that were actually producing their own power. You didn't have a national energy grid. What we have to go back to is what we've proposed is that you have to have a national banking system. You have to deal with the entire financial system that we've talked about many times on this program. But you, with a national banking system, you would literally nationalise the electricity grid and, and then begin to rebuild it using the most modern forms of power available, which is actually nuclear, nuclear power. power. You shut down the renewable energy rubbish because that is you, you can't actually get enough energy from the renewals side of things, no matter how you how you want to push and maybe we'll take that up sub that subject up in another program but essentially you want to be able to create the cheapest possible electricity and copious amounts of it which means investing in hydroelectricity more of that sort of electricity as well uh, but also you know more in terms of uh, nuclear power but it all has to be funded not from foreign capital from going to private investors where you pit the interests of private investors against this idea of developing economy and pay big interest rates and pay huge interest rates you have to do it through you know, very negligible interest rates from national banking to produce copious amounts of If you took that, if you power. use national banking, you took that usury component of private financing out of it, the actual cost that they all wring their hands one about to now two, would three, be tiny. One to, one to two, maybe three cents per kilowatt hour, if that. I mean, the point is that you're talking about massive speculation here, massive spec, a massive rundown of the, of the efficiency of power stations. Um, and no investment into the, the, the new generations in this country of nuclear power stations. And the irony is, Craig, just in the time we've got left, uh, when we did have state-owned electricity in Victoria, which was much cheaper than now, and it was the, the number of employees of those state-owned state -owned power system was 10 times... 27,000, I thought it was. No, exactly. Down to 9,000. And it was it. still cheaper power. Yes. All right, well, this is um, the beginning of this subject. We're going to put out a release on this. L look out for that. Um, but we have to end there. When we come back, we're going to talk about the Glass-Steagall debate in Australia. Welcome back to the CEC Report. The Glass-Steagall debate has erupted in Australia. On the 6th of August, the Australian Financial Review ran a big feature headlined, Big Four Might Make Better Eight. And the basis of this feature was an unnamed, very senior banking executive in Australia, who didn't want to be named because of the sensitivity of what he was saying, is warning that our banks are in trouble and what they need to do is split up along the lines of Glass-Steagall. Which, which is to separate out the investment banks from the trading banks, but also to break off insurance companies, stockbroking houses and so forth out of the banking system and separate them all out again. Because in Australia they're all um, muddled in together mm -hmm. and separate them out so that the people that think they're protected, which is depositors, can actually be protected 
um, but the government doesn't have to bankrupt themselves by having to extend that protection to everything else the banks are doing. Which at the present uh, time, Robbie, is $250,000 per depositor, right? Which is not going to be enough in the terms of a massive cri crisis across the banking system. Um, and it's, I think, Craig, it's quite significant that this man didn't want to identify himself yes, as a person. Is. Shouldn't assume he's There's dead. a lot of stuff, Robbie, that I've been doing relating to the financial system that's completely hidden and very, very top secret because they don't want to know, they don't want to release the nature of the banking system and the, the precariousness of it to the public because that would create crises of confidence. Well, um, David Murray was quoted in this article. Now, David Murray is the former head of the Commonwealth Bank and he's also been the head of the Future Fund for a long time. And he came out to downplay this. Oh, no, no, we don't want to go there. And in fact, and he sort of said it would be hard to do because it had to be funded by foreign investment. And that's not going to happen. And I don't understand what he's talking about there. Um, but he said, he, he showed his stripes because... Instead, he promoted this idea that the Brits have been um, trying to hang on to a ring fencing, where you, say, where you don't actually split them off. You say that the bank themselves should, should internally separate the depositors from the rest of the... That didn't work in Britain. Didn't work in Britain. It's a fraud. Everyone has seen through it there. But interestingly, Craig, there is one bank here in Australia that already is ring fenced voluntarily by itself, and that's Macquarie no. Bank. And this same article admits that even though Macquarie Bank says, oh, we take deposits, but that's separated over here from everything else we do, there's nothing to stop Macquarie Bank, if its investment stuff got into trouble, from raiding its depositors. To it's not a very up. strong fence. No, it's a, it's, it's a joke. Now, we initiated this debate. The, the, what's happened in the financial review it reflects what we've started. No one else in Australia has been talking about this except us. So, so it's taken off here. Um, but the fact it has taken off, I've got a couple of things for you to talk about. That, would that indicate that the cracks are appearing in our supposedly sound system, one. Look, yep. And two, um, just comment on what's happened in the US this week because the fight there on this has really heated up. Well, first thing, Robbie, is that LaRouche has led the fight for, for a Rooseveltian style glass steagle for several years now as, as the only solution. After the LIBOR crisis recently, the, the whole frauds, top echelons of the financial oligarchy came out basically calling for LaRouche's policy for Glass-Steagall. You know, Lord Minor, Peter Ambrose, and you had um, some very other high-ranking people in the United States call for it as well. Now, this has been a hot, hot issue in the Democratic campaign. In fact, there was a, a resolution put up for, to the uh, Democratic Party platform now this for means this election. for this election coming up where, where, where they take this issue of a Glass-Steagall to the American people. Now there's 170, 80, 87 members of this po policy platform committee and they had a resolution up on fi uh, at 5pm on Friday um, this uh, afternoon, this, this, last just, week. This, this last week. And by 7 o'clock in the morning, the Obama administration had basically arm wrestled, to arm twisted the person who put up the motion to withdraw it. There was 15 co-sponsors that were waiting to support this motion, but by the morning, after the deadlines, the whole thing was taken off the table. So you can see that Obama, one of the most popular policy amendments that would save the American system, has been literally destroyed by Obama himself, which tells you how much Obama is in the pay of the large uh, banks that see themselves as being... Um, yeah, a target of the breakup that uh, the Glass-Steagall would require. Well, they know their looting would, the divisions would collapse with it if under Glass-Steagall. Very quickly. So uh, there's going to be big, 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 more big fights about this in the US because this, 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 is, uh, this is the issue. And that's coming into Australia. There's no way they're going to stop this. It's a major point of discussion in, in England, major, major point of discussion in the uh, United States. And in Australia, though, do you think it would indicate the fact that it's been talked about in this way now that the cracks are appearing? Yes, it does. Look, we already know what the situation is with the, the banks here, there's, and there's plenty of literature around where they've actually researched the potential of banks uh, you know, going under. Now, there's all sorts of hype about this, and we just have to, we have to keep an eye on it very closely. All right. Thanks for that, Craig. When we come back, finally, we're going to talk about the curiosity triumph of landing on Mars. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC Report. Finally, the curiosity triumph gives humanity hope. So this week, or in the, uh, about a week ago, you had this um, brilliant success where NASA landed this Curiosity rover on Mars, the biggest one they've landed to date, the most complicated mission they've ever done, Craig, um, which involved a number of steps to, to make sure that the um, rover was in the best shape it could be when it was actually deployed. Not on just there. a number, thousands of steps. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and across 
the distance to Mars, and it took it's. And I it's think a it was twenty minute time lag, isn't it? For fourteen the fourteen minute time, 14 lag. Minute time lag. But this craft was launched on the 29th of November last year, and it's taken that long to get there. I mean, phenomenal. Um, and Australia played a role, like we did with the moon landing. Yes. Um, our signals are well positioned to um, feed NASA the material on this. In fact, it was Australia that confirmed that the landing had taken place. So this was brilliant. Um, but there's a tragedy here because it's NASA's last hurrah under Obama's budget cuts. He's gutted the NASA program and what Obama is, is, is um, promoting for NASA to do is this um, private partnership stuff where they put things into near-Earth orbit uh, using private companies rather than expand the horizons yeah, of the world. Privatising space. Exactly. Um, now, Craig, sometimes people have difficulty understanding how these breakthroughs benefit their daily lives. And you know, there's a lot of people that are trying to tell them, oh, this is, you know, th this is no use to you or whatever. But when people are in an economic crisis and you know, they're, they're being subjected to austerity, they're saying, well, well, what's the good of this? So why is this the hope for humanity? Well, humanity has always progressed, Robbie, because of the fact that we have the ability to make discoveries of the physical principles that govern the way the universe works. And to be able to slow, to take a craft, send it right across to Mars, have this thing the size of a car, reduce in speed by remote sensors, remote controls from 6,000 metres per second or something like that, down to you know, just a, a fraction of a metre per second. So far away, it gives you a sense of the complexity of dealing with these physical principles. Now, if we can do that way out there in Mars, how can we take these principles and then embody them in processes on the face of the planet to solve problems of food production, to solve problems of manufacturing, of developing tunnels under the sea, high-speed rails, and so forth. So what we're saying is that when you go into the front, the, the interesting things in science are always on the frontiers. They're never the stuff that you learn in textbooks. They're never the stuff that you can sort of do in the easy formats. It's always the stuff that's the most difficult to achieve that, that, that highlight the best uh, successes or the, the, the principles that we need to understand. And it's the physical frontiers too, not computer simulation. No, no, no. The, the, the real world, you know, where you, you know, something falls on your head, that's the reality. <laughs> we you know, yeah, yeah. you know the sensors tell you something's going on, then you discover the principles behind it. So with this particular landing, what you've, this is a tremendous breakthrough from the point of view of, it again, shows the nature of mankind. Now, your local pet dog didn't do this, or the rabbit, you know, the, orang orangutans, the, orangutan, no. the orangutans didn't do it. The gorillas in Africa didn't do it. This is human beings doing this. So therefore, the potentiality of human creative thought, of making these sorts of discoveries, is the key here. If, you've pro if you uh, promote this sort of thinking, if you develop the scientific and technological uh, capabilities of your nation, then there is no boundaries that mankind can't overcome. And that therefore means that we don't need financial oligarchies. We don't need a financial monetary system that is killing people and has a policy of reducing the world's population from 7 billion down to below 1 billion. And that's where Obama fits in, as a tool of the British program for population reduction. And the shutdown of NASA is simply another uh, measure of the genocidal policies that he's pushing. Because it's technology that allows us to solve our problems and they're trying to take the technology away from human beings. And that's Just what like the British Empire has always done. Going back to Zeus. Yes. Chaining Prometheus to a rock for giving human beings fire. So it didn't work Obama and we'll have to make sure it doesn't work in the future. All right. That's it for this week's CEC report. Thanks for tuning in. Get onto our website for more details and tune in next week for more.